Hi, Sean. How's it, guys? How are you? All right, thanks, you. Good, thanks for joining us. Okay, just before we start, I just got to do a few Later. formalities. Um, my name is Andrew McKenna. I'm the founder of the African Turf Academy. I started this series just to showcase the different areas of the big golf industry. Um, I'm trying to stay away from the professional game, but I asked Sean because he's, he's been around the African Turf Academy for many years. Uh, sometimes he's played with some of the students. The students have got to know him a bit. Um, and, you know, uh, that was one of the reasons. The other two reasons are he, uh, you know, like many of the other guys we've had on, the successful greenkeepers and the other parts of the industry, he likes to share his knowledge with uh, everyone around him, which is a great attribute. And the other thing is he doesn't like talking about himself. So I, uh, I'm going to get him to talk about himself today. <laughs> All right, a few quick five, a few quick five questions for you, Sean. Uh, Jack or Tiger? Uh, tiger. Okay. Uh, the Open or the Masters? The Open. Okay. And um, the sea or the bushveld? The ocean, sea. Sea, okay. All right, we'll kick off now. Um, give us a little background into your, uh, your why you got into golf, how you got into golf, um, and your journey to uh, even be at a point where you considered being a pro golfer. Well, I um, grew up in a golfing family. So mom and dad uh, played golf. And we just followed up uh, from a young age. They took us out to the golf course and the ranges and um, basically went from there. Started, like I said, very young. Um, and then my parents were, they were really supportive of everything and then gave us the opportunity by moving to Silver Lakes when the golf estate opened. So it really gave us an awesome uh, step into the right direction if we wanted to pursue golf as a living. Okay. So those of you who don't know, Sean, he's one of three brothers who all played for golf for South Africa. Um, um, okay. So when, you, when, when did you realize that maybe you could, uh, you could make a living from playing golf? Well, I think I was, when I turned, uh, I think it was 12 or 13 when I reached uh, uh, scratch golf. Uh, playing good golf and uh, started watching golf, I thought, you know, this is a career I'd like to pursue. Um, over the next couple of years, started making provincial teams, uh, international teams and things like that, which was uh, enables you to start traveling the world and seeing other countries and uh, playing against uh, golfers that are as good and better, better than you. So, uh, and I really liked the challenge of it. So from there on, just uh, kept pursuing and wanted to do it for a living. Okay. Forgive me if I get some facts wrong, but I think in 2002, you, you uh, were picked for the Eisenhower Trophy, right? So yeah. the, again, the Eisenhower Trophy is a three-man team from all the, all the countries in the world. And, and, and your two, your two uh, 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 teammates were? Charles Swartzel and uh, Louis Westhuizen. Okay, so that team has all gone on to make a living from playing golf, which is probably unusual. Um, so, and then, and then you, you then turned pro straight after that, did you? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, so basically reached the highest uh, team sports or African team that you could, uh, South African team you could uh, do in amateur golf. So decided, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm old enough to try and take on the pro circuit and uh, try and start a career from there. Okay, and then you're, uh, and then you won fairly quickly, right? You won the African Open somewhere. Uh, no, about about yeah, about five year, five and a half years later, I won the African Open in uh, um, down in East London or Port Alfred, uh, Fish uh, Fish River Sun, which was nice. But uh, it was it was a long road up to that. I mean, as you know, pro golf is not easy. You don't just walk onto the golf course and start earning money. There's a lot of good players out there, and they as good and maybe better than you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in in uh, I've known you for about uh, nine or ten years now. Probably in the last five years, uh, your career has has taken a considerably upward turn. Was was there a turning point? Is there a specific moment that you can identify? Was there something that happened that changed? Or? Um. Funny enough, I was looking through, through a bunch of old photographs at home and I saw a swing of one of my swings when I was about 16 years old. 
And I decided to just go try and go back to my roots and try and feel like I'm just swinging the club like I used to instead of being mechanical or anything, just play the game and start enjoying myself again. And then, you know, with the support of my wife and everything like that, uh, all came together um, with the family, which was great. So from there on, it just felt like I, was, I started enjoying the game again and started playing better. Okay, and recently you told me a little story about... Um... A saying you, uh, I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but you said, uh, uh, I'm going to try and read it. Uh, if you can hold it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. I, I love that when you told me that. So maybe you can elaborate on that because that applies, that applies across any, uh, any industry. Anything, in anything, it applies throughout anything in life. I mean, if you can, if you can visualize it and envision it, and really believe hard, hard, hard enough in yourself to achieve it. You will be able to achieve it. It's just basically, you just got to go out and go and fetch it. Mm, exactly. A beautiful message that. Um, okay, right. So what, what is the, um, the toughest part that you find about, of this journey of being a, 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 you know, the industry of golf is massive and every, every part of it has different challenges. I think the pro golfer challenge is, is different from the other ones, even though they can relate to it. But what, what do you think is, is the, what, what are the biggest challenges for you? I think uh, some of the biggest challenges I had to overcome over the years is it's one, one, it's a lonely sport. You, you travel by, uh, by yourself. Uh, you, you don't normally share rooms all the time. So you always by yourself. So you go for dinner by yourself. It's not fun to go sit in a restaurant with full of people and you're sitting on a one man table. Um, that was one of the biggest things. And then the other thing is all the traveling. I mean, you're constantly living out of a suitcase. You're leaving your family at home. You don't see them for three, four, five weeks at a time. So, you know, it's not always as glamorous as people would say. Um, you do give up a lot, a lot. You do sacrifice a lot by doing all these things to be able to pursue your dream. Yeah, and the other thing you challenge is uh, like time change. You've got to go. You've got to leave South Africa, fly fifteen hours, whatever it is, land in Japan or in America or Mexico, and then you've got to perform. Do, well, do I you have some... only fifteen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So do you have any, any, uh, any tricks, any, any things that you picked up that make that easier? Well, there's, the, to... there's the two events that I've played over the last few years. Uh, the one is in uh, Shitosi Island, northern, northern, uh, North Island of Japan. That normally takes about uh, close to 30 hours to get there. And then the other one is Mexico, also takes close to 30 hours to get that side of the world. But... Um, I think for me, hours, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> what I've learned is flying, flying west is a lot easier for me to adapt than to fly east. When I fly east, I, you always lose time. When you fly west, you make time. But um, the one thing I've realized and I've read up on things that doctors say about jet lag and things like that, the one thing about jet lag, it comes from your stomach. So uh, definitely the times that you eat and and um, consume drinks or cold drinks and things like that messes up with your routine back home. So if you can try and plan it out that you eat at the same time as you would back home for just the first two days, then you actually fall into a better, uh, better routine. Mm -hmm. Basically, well, what I started doing is I'll, I'll make sure that I'll try and fly at lunchtime. I normally fly to leave here at lunchtime or in the evening. So I'll have lunch before I get on the flight or I'll have dinner before I get on the flight and I would not eat until the next destination. Okay. And by doing that, I actually started realizing I wasn't getting affected that much. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so that you, just by eating, it makes the it not, it neutralize, well, as much as possible. Yeah, I that's think that's, you know, that's, one, that's the one thing I've tried all the... the the medication that people have told me about and buying uh, certain supplements at uh, pharmacies and that, and that's never worked for me. And this is the only thing that I've realized that's actually worked for me so far. 
Yeah. Okay, so around this time of the interview, into, into the chat, we uh, asked the guys who are watching to ask questions. Nikki, Nikki Curtain, who you know, um, <laughs> it's got a question that I've got later on. So Nikki, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna deal with that later. Um, I want to talk about uh, birdies for rhinos quickly. I know it's something that you're proud of being involved in. Uh, tell us what is what is that all about? And and I believe you won an order of merit last year. What 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 was that all about? So basically, it's one of my best friends, Justin Walters, who plays on the European tour. Started this in, uh, this initiative. Um, you know, we we all uh, he's got two young young kids. I've got a youngster now. And, you know, what's happening with all the poaching and things, they don't have the finances to try and stop all of this and uh, try and protect the, the rhinos and that. So he started this by pulling in a couple of celebrities and golfers to say, support this cause, to try and help them financially so that they can protect the rhinos from poachers and things like that. In any case, so we've got a, he's got a, very nice group built up together from, from players like Dean Burmester, uh, Justin Rose, uh, Ryan Fox. And, you know, we all love the bushveld and we want to protect it as much as we can. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely made a big, big uh, dent into the po poaching system at the moment, which, which is great. So, I mean, like, I'd like for my son to be able to see the rhinos walk, uh, walk around in the, in the parks one day and, and not be enclosed in cages and things like that. Mm. Yeah, so the, the golf pros out, the pro golfers out there are uh, doing their bit to try and uh, help the environment as well, which is a topic that we spoke to the RNA about on Thursday. Uh, just the environmental support and the uh, sustainability of golf. So it's great to hear that the, the pro golfers are also doing their bit. Okay, uh, the, the, the topic that Nikki was asking about, I might as well fire it away now. Um, uh, probably, I don't know, you're probably the, the, the round of golf that uh, put you in the biggest limelight. Maybe not um, the round that you felt was the biggest limelight, but uh, got you on the TV and you performed amazingly that day was when you played the Tiger at Carnoustie in uh, 2018. Is that 2018? 2018? Yeah. Yeah, so. the, was, yeah, yeah, it was 2018, you're right. Uh, the year, yeah. yeah, the year Molinari won and Tiger yeah. was at a chance. So um, tell us about that. Tell us about uh, that day when you saw you had the draw, um, how it felt to play, because uh, I, I know you described him as a, on, on the media as a mythical creature. Um, <laughs> <'cause he hadn't... laughs> so tell, tell us about, tell us about that. You know, they, they, they generally send out the, the tea, tea times the night before and, uh, and they do it with uh, little photographs of the players. And um, I was sitting around the dinner table. I had my mother there and my wife and, um, and my main manager. And we were sitting along there and um, the next minute um, I get this message <laughs> showing my picture with Tiger. And I show my mom this picture and she just about flipped out because she says she won't be able to see anything of the whole round because we all know that people stand about 40 deep on all sides. But, you know, it's, it's like playing. It's, you know, Tiger is one of the best players in the world. You want to play with him someday in your life. You, uh, it's, it's like a dream for everybody. I, I mean, so... You know, it was exciting, but I, got, I was nervous. I didn't know how to handle it. Uh, but, you know, got to the golf course, I was still fine. I was relaxed. Went to the range, I was still fine. I was relaxed. But as soon as I started walking to the first tee, I knew that this was going to, it's going to happen. I got to the tee a little bit too early. I, waited, I had to wait around. But uh, eventually, Tiger arrives to the tee. And, uh, um, you know, your your insides are just going nuts. It's just you're shaking it on. You don't know how to handle this. So you, it's such a different experience. You can't you can't train yourself for this. But uh, I think the funniest story of the whole 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 setup was uh, when I did target teed off first. When I did get to the tee, um, I lined up. I put my ball in the ground. I 
took a step back and I felt all the nerves start kicking in in one go. And my caddy, Francois Olivier, uh, he was halfway in his senses to tell me where the wind was coming from and I just decided to hit because I felt that if I didn't hit the, pull the trigger right then and there, I was going to miss the ball. So, um, but what an experience to have been able to play with him. Um, I think mm -hmm. the, the fact that I made birdie on the first hole relaxed me a lot. But uh, we had such a good time. Uh, we, he chats a lot. He's actually such a nice person, down to earth. The only problem is he's got to build up this wall around him because of all the people. And, I mean, there was great comments being yelled from the sides and there was terrible comments being yelled from the sides. So I can understand he's, he's got to live in a, a different world to anybody else. Mm. And uh, believe it or not, me and Sean cross paths quite often on the range, but we very rarely chat about golf. Um, uh, but one day he, I asked him about uh, his experience with Tiger and he spoke about something that was glaringly obvious that Tiger did so well to, to cope with that. Uh, can you remember? Can you remember what he said to me? Just the, fo the focus and the, the routine he's got is just, mm. it stands out, stands out more and better than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, if he, from setting up, standing behind the ball in his pre-shot routine and lining up from stepping forward into the ball to hitting the ball, I think, I don't think there's a second of difference, it's microseconds if it's anything, but it's always so consistent. Hmm. And is that something that you've uh, brought into your game since, since, you, um, since you played with it? I definitely started working a lot more on trying to get a more stable routine, more consistent routine. Um, we all know these days that you get fired up, you start playing well, you start walking quicker, you want to hit the ball quicker. These days that you play badly, you, you want to break things and you start faffing around over the ball and you're trying different things, which doesn't help. So it's it's a way of trying to switch switch your mind off of the obstacles around you instead of worrying about what mood you're in instead of just thinking of that routine at that time and getting over the shot and focusing on your target mm, that's a great again a great message for even even in your workplace is just to try and do things repeatedly to try and nullify the pressure of whatever you're doing um, okay so um some quick questions your your favorite tournament victory um you know, I won a couple of nice ones in Japan, but I think the one that stands out the most uh, was um, I won I won the one the week after the birth of my son in uh, Okinawa Islands in Japan, and I, I had one of my great friends, Chase Manor, caddying for me that week, and it was just special for with everything going on around me at that moment. So it was really really awesome to pull that off. Okay, and while you're talking about your son, uh, do you want him to be a pro golfer as well? I'm not going to force him into it, but, you know, I'd like for him to play golf. I'd like for him to uh, be sport, uh, in a sporty, um, that go in a sporty direction. Um, but, you know, uh, let's see. Uh, hopefully he follows in dad's footsteps. Yeah. Unfortunately, it won't be your choice. It'll be his, won't it? <laughs> All right, the lowest round of your career? Professional, 61. Uh, local, 59. Okay, the, uh, the, the, the professional one, where was that? That was Myanmar. When I won uh, the Myanmar, uh, Myanmar Open to qualify and got my card for the Japanese tour. That was a, bit, that was a big moment in your life, huh? Eh? Yeah, it was. Okay, and um, the favorite event, most favorite event you've ever played in? I gotta say, British Open. I've enjoyed every second about the British Open. What I've played, it was Royal Burke, Tel Carnoustie, Royal Portrush. They've all been awesome. Uh, so I've, I've I've always liked links golf. So I'm definitely going to say the Open. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, your friend Christoph Els uh, is asking from the states. Uh, your got your golfing idol growing up, and he says, besides me. <laughs> Well, uh, if I can roll up my sleeve here and just tighten it so that the shirt's not too 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 uh, too loose for him. Um, 
you know, there were so many good golfers growing up, and I loved watching all of them. And uh, but you know, I think Ernie as was one of our greatest idols as a South African, watching him win uh, the U.S. Opens in '94, '97, things like that. Where I think we all aspired to try and be like him. So he was a definitely um, one of my biggest idols. Okay, and Fraser Knox. You might remember Fraser from the Pro Shop mm -hmm. Silver Lakes. He says, if there was one thing in your game you would change, what would it be? Well, you know, I'm hitting the ball so well at the moment and I can't complain about my putting. So definitely around the, around the greens, I'll still try and perfect that bit more. Okay. And just before we get back to my questions, Tina's, Tina's Keller is asking, what is the thing about the Japanese culture that you enjoy the most? Everything is easy. Everything's so easy and everything works. Everything's in, pl in place. The people are friendly. I mean, there's nothing you can complain about them when you're in that country. So um, they're always friendly. They smile at you. They're always helpful. So it's just it's a fun place to be. Okay, good stuff. Right, so when we, um, you know, obviously we're the African Turf Academy and we're training young guys to, you know, if they don't make it as players to become golf course managers. When you play golf, uh, do you notice the, the grass? Do you notice the condition of golf courses? Do you notice uh, what the greenkeepers have done to prepare it for you? Or, or, or is your mind so focused on the game that you, uh, you don't notice those things? I remember no, when, no. I played, when I played or tried to play, I didn't notice that. <laughs> I just... <laughs> no, um, you know, all golf courses and countries are all different. And that's one thing I've... I started trying to incorporate. I try and instead of just looking down and playing a practice round and not worrying about it, I to actually try and look around me. I try and see the types of trees they have, I try to, the types of sand they use in bunkers, the type of grass they grow. And it's definitely come, it helped me a lot because you approach shots differently because you can have a certain grass, uh, uh, Kentucky Blue, which is a softer grass, and if it's very wet, the ball's not going to run at all. So you definitely got to approach the, uh, the shots differently off the tee if you want to maximize it on the hole. So you got to float the ball, fly it further. You can't run it up there. Um, so, yeah, definitely I've, I've paid attention over the, to those scenarios over the last couple of years, uh, looking at how they're building the courses, how they're um, trying to shape the fairways and use – conditions to benefit the course mm. and uh, I think you know we unfortunately in South Africa you don't have the big variety of grasses that grow out here you have basically Kukuyu grows up in the, in the Transvaal or anyway and then as soon as you go to the coast it's it becomes a completely different grass uh, or what we call Skapgrat whatever it's more grainy mm. and things like that mm. so um where, where in Japan I've played in in one area and six different courses had six different grasses. So it all do they do on. they primarily have warm season grasses or cool season grasses in Japan? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Well, you no, know, no. You, you see, they got that. Uh, I don't know what is, what it's called again, but it does go yellow in the winter time when as soon as it goes, but it's still there. It still grows. Mm, okay. Oh, they, but the fair, but they get the fairways to stay green and the greens to, greens to stay green. It's just the rough that goes yellow. Yeah. So, um, but the big thing is the amount of time they spend on their courses and money is just phenomenal. I mean, they yeah. love golf so much. And um, the one course I played up north, uh, I think the guy said to me membership there was five hundred thousand dollars a year to try and get into it. And but the golf whole golf course was bent grass. From tee to green was full on bent grass. If the tees, they had holes on the tees so they could putt, putt if you were waiting. The fairways were running at 10 11 and the greens were running at 14. So, I mean, when you get yeah. that money in, I'm sure you can do that to a golf course. Mm, and do you, do you ch have to change your game when you, from, like, from uh, the extremes of maybe the Kikuyu of Johannesburg and Pretoria to the, the, the links of Port Rush? How do you, what well, do you do with your, your swing and what do you do with your pitching my, and so 
I think my biggest problem is as soon as I go from Kukuyu to uh, Bermuda or uh, bent grass fairway or things, I started. I start over attacking the ball uh, because I'm thinking the ball's lying too low or it's t too tight. So I've got to actually back off and force myself to try and stay on my level playing swing and sweeping the ball off the floor and knowing that I won't uh, do anything stupid. But um, there are different ways to approach certain shots, definitely, when it comes to playing on Kukuya because Kukuyu feels like the ball's sitting up, it's teed up all the time, uh, where, you know, Bermuda and those types of grasses always sits a little bit down. Mm, okay. All, all right. right. Um, how do you... So your life is, is uh, focused on playing golf uh, and trying to be the best golfer you can be. How do you... What do you do to get your mind off it? What do you do to... Because I know you love playing golf. I mean, it, what's... what's uh, again, it's a... Um, a common trait amongst the guys, all the guys that I've interviewed in the last three, four weeks, is that they love what they do. There's a, there's a real passion for it. And I can see that, you know, a lot of guys after playing golf for 20 years professionally, they tend to maybe lose the passion for playing. But you 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 enjoy this for fun, right? I've made a, I make a stupid joke with everybody else. I'm like a fine wine. I just kind of feel like I'm getting better with age. But... Um... I still enjoy every minute of it. I, I love playing. I, I mean, I put myself in situations sometimes being away from home for two, three months at a time um, because I keep enjoying it. I, I feel like the next tournament, I can, I can win every week. And mm. I'll come home. If I start feeling a little bit miserable or something, I'll come home for a week or two. But that has never happened. Um, I still enjoy every second and I want to play all the time. But, you know, if... I don't know what I'm, I'm going to do for the day I have to stop. So uh, I'm still trying to figure that out, still trying to find a hobby. I've, I've got a bunch of things in the garage, fishing rods and things like that. I enjoy that. But, you know, I can do that for one or two days and then I, I want to go back to a golf course and go play. Well, luckily, luckily in golf, if you love it that much, you don't have to stop, do you? Uh, there was one of no. my questions. What are you going to do after you finish playing? But I can see with you, you don't have to worry about that. You're just going to carry on playing. As long as, as long as the body stays strong and I uh, prevent any injuries and things like that, I'll carry on. So let's see. Okay. All right. So, um, guys, if you've got any questions for Sean, uh, SGN Bruce is asking, how do you keep your game in shape during lockdown? Well, thanks. SGN gave me a nice mat uh, when he still had a driving range. So um, I use using that and I put up a net in the backyard. So... Definitely doing a lot of drills and things like that to try and keep the swing loose and uh, things like that. Um, you know, there's nothing else we can do at the moment. Uh, so hopefully the government uh, allows us to be able to play golf in the next couple of weeks or open the golf courses for driving ranges even from there. Mm. Okay, and when do, you, when do you see yourself? Have you got any inside info on when the Japanese tour might start up again or... I know uh, the, the, what that might, that's one issue, and then when can you get there is another issue. Yeah, you know, I actually got a nice letter from a guy who's in the States uh, saying that uh, they're looking at trying to get me an invite for the Charles Schwab. And uh, that's in middle June, I think, or in, end of June. So that's, that's nice to see that the U.S. tour is starting in middle June. They're going to basically open up their doors again. It might not have spectators on the golf course, but at least they're starting up events. Um, the European Tour, they, they've they been pretty quiet because of the coronavirus really hitting that side of the world a lot more. Um, but then the Japanese Tour is also thinking of uh, end of June. Uh, so we'll wait and see. But like you said, the other problem is that the courses on that side might open, but if I can't get out of the country, then that's also a problem. So mm. maybe, uh, maybe I have to try and phone some friends and see if somebody's got a private jet. <laughs> no, I, I, you've, got, you've got someone you know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nikki, there's a few questions coming in, so let's deal with them. Nikki, Curtain again, uh, your dream four ball, dead or alive? Um, my father. Um, you know... I'll, I'll say Ernie Earls, my father, and a good friend of his, uh, David Frost. Okay, very nice. 
Very nice. And then Michael Van Heerden is asking, what's your biggest inspiration? Um, after, you know, my dad was always a big inspiration for me. He was always, always there supportive. Uh, as you could see every morning at eight o'clock when I used to practice, he used to pop around the driving range with his golf cart and the dogs and just come and watch me at pools and he, he, he wanted to live his, this was his dream, basically, to become a professional golfer. And I've just pursued it from there on. And ever since that day, I've just decided, you know, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I want to do. I love it every, every second about it and I'm going to do it for you. Okay. Um, so apart from your dad, uh, have you had um, mentors in your life that you still, you still rely on and depend on? What do you mean? Uh, people that you look up to and you know look look for advice and yeah. uh, you yeah. know just to help you help you through the challenges of your of, it's not it's not a trick question it's, yeah uh, no 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 just to help um, you through you know your challenges in your life you playing know, challenges playing challenges yeah you know there's there's always there's a bunch of players on tour that I can always talk to uh, we are good uh, Justin Walters which is one of them um, we grew up together but. I've been there for him, and he's been there for me got a week, uh, all, our li all our lives. So definitely there's a bunch of them. And then there's a new, few new people that's come into my life over the last couple of years that's really, really encouraged me a lot and give it, spoken to me and given me the right uh, words to put me back on the right path again, mm -hmm. which is great. So, no, you're definitely going to get people that come into your life for, for a reason. Okay, and then Alan Williams is asking most the, the most stressful tournament you've ever played in. Uh, first British Open, uh, Royal Birkdale. I mean, uh, I actually couldn't get the ball on the tee on the first hole, first day. <laughs> it's a tough shot. It's a tough shot that uh, first tee shot. That especially at that course because you want to hit driver, but you know you can't hit driver on that hole. It doesn't allow it. But. Um, yeah, my brother Elaine was caddying for me that uh, that that week, and uh, he just, as we walked off the tee, started laughing. And I said, "You know what's wrong with you?" He says, "I was laughing at you. you can't you can't get the ball on the tee, and then you couldn't even keep the club still behind the ball." So <laughs> I said to him, "Next time you hit the tee shot for me, please." <laughs> yeah, yeah. See how he gets on. Yeah, and then you and then you shot sixty five in the third round there, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, so no, it was, a, it was a great week. It was nice to be able to do that and see that uh, I'm a capable of good scores in those types of events. Okay. All right, it's time for a couple of uh, quick questions for me. Uh, trees or no trees? Trees. Okay. Cricket or rugby? Rugby. And um, chicken, or, chicken or beef? Definitely beef. <laughs> okay. Chicken um, is a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> Chicken's a vegetable. And then Michael Venier is asking a question you've already answered. If you could win a major, which one would it be on what course? Sean said the open. On the on which course? You know, that that's a tough question. I think it doesn't matter which course you want to win. If you can win an open, you'll be happy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Get your name on that claret jug. Yeah. Okay, right. Uh, last couple of questions for me, which um and it was one that came up earlier. What advice would you give a youngster who wants to be a pro golfer? How how would you say they should practice? How uh, I, I I like to um, when I'm talking to these guys, it's uh, you, I think you need to appreciate how good the good guys are, uh, and it really they are, really are incredible. When when Sean plays at Silver Lakes on a Wednesday, he doesn't shoot 69, he doesn't shoot 68, he shoots 60. 59, 62, and it's not just once, it's every flipping week. <laughs> so, your, your, you advice, know, your advice to be a, a good, uh, to be a pro golfer? You know, my dad gave me good advice once uh, when I was a youngster. He says, if you can score under 68 at your home course every single day, this is a, as an amateur and you go to any other course outside your own course and shoot under level par every single time you play, you're in a position to be able to turn pro. From there, I think 
you'll start learning to understand that your own course is your own course. You you know it inside out. So you're always going to uh, score decent scores. But it's trying to keep the numbers off the scorecard when you play foreign courses and things like that. So, you know, if you can break par every time you play on foreign courses, I think you're definitely on the right path. Mm. And then the other thing is trying to find find a good routine in practice. Trying to find where you do an hour of hitting balls, an hour of chipping, an hour of putting, and then going back and then doing maybe a half an hour extra on driving. Um, because, you know, you think you're working hard, but I promise you there's somebody else out there that's working harder than you. Mm. And uh, do, do you, are you a big believer in hitting like thousands of balls or is it more uh, quality practice that... No, that I used to do that when I was a youngster. I used to hit thousands and thousands of balls. I mean, so eventually uh, you start realizing it doesn't work because after 100 balls, you start getting tired uh, mentally and physically and you start uh, lose, losing concentration. So you're not actually focusing, you're not making good swings at it uh, and positive swings at the ball anymore. So I think if you can go in there with a goal of hitting, even if you're hitting only 50 balls and making sure you do a proper routine over every single shot, picking a target and making a positive swing at it, you'll actually teach yourself a lot more by doing that than hitting a thousand balls at a time. Hmm. And the balance between long game and short game? Uh, I think, you know, there is definitely a balance, um, a difference. Um, but I would say you need to do, if you work it out perfect, correctly, if you can hit a 9-9, you can definitely hit a 7-9. If you can hit a 7-9, you can hit a 5-9. But the thing is, you don't hit many of those during your round. So I, I would say if you can spend a lot of time on hitting driver's fairway woods and two, maybe long irons uh, that you used normally hit off the tee, and then doing a lot of work on chipping and, putt and putting, I mean, then I think you're on the, on the right path. Yeah, you, you do a lot of work on your putting. You you hit balls in the morning and then you spend hours on the on on your putting. Whereas and that's something you have to force other guys to do. Whereas you do it because you understand the importance. Okay, yeah. um, what do you what, what do you see happening going forward with this virus and this hold up? Do you uh, is it going to affect the obviously the calendar? Uh, How is it going to affect you? Well, it's, yeah, no, it's definitely affecting a lot of things. I mean, I would have been into the Dell match play this year, but unfortunately they cancelled that due to the virus. Um, at the moment, I've got the PGA coming up, um, so I'm into that. Um, play, if I can get out and play a couple of events and get some good points to it, I can maybe qualify, still qualify for the US Open and the Masters. Mm. So it's just a question of seeing what's going to happen. Um, hopefully you can mm. get out of here and, uh, start off with a bang and maybe try and play well in the first couple of events and go from there. And the, and and the world ranking is it is it if they if they carry on is it is it moving now because it works on a on a year um, it drops off on a weekly basis, doesn't it? No, they they basically what they did is they stalled it uh, because they um, one reasoning was because. Uh, McElroy was picking up week after week uh, world ranking points because he was staying at number one. So they said, no, 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 but because he's adding up weeks to his, uh, he's going to catch, he's eventually going to catch Tiger for the most of oh, okay. as a number one player, but there's no golf going on. So they had to stall it in a way and find a way to keep it balanced. So at the moment, the rankings are all stalled. Uh, you stay in one position until tournament start up again. Okay. All right, Sean, that's pretty much it for me. Um, thanks, for, thanks for giving us your time. Uh, this interview will go live on our Instagram, IGTV. Um, I'll send it to you. And, um, but if anyone wants to get hold of you, how can they get hold of you on your... Uh, what, what social media handles have you got? Well, I've got, I'm, on, on, I'm on Instagram. Uh, so just find Sean Norris. And uh, then um, Sean underscore PJ for uh, Twitter and Sean Norris at, uh, on Facebook. Okay. All right. All right, Sean. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your time. Uh, keep yourself Pleasure. busy and uh, hopefully you you can get your career back up and running again as soon as possible. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. All right. Take thanks. Care.
Bye. See you soon. Bye. Cheers.